and what are sort of that, uh, and what ideas sort of behind behind these structures are. And um, two days ago, I, I noticed that Theo actually gave a talk about exactly this topic uh, half a year before we finished this paper, and uh, the proof looked pretty different. I was quite surprised price how different actually the proof was sort of at that time versus the time when we finished the paper. I think when Theo, Theo gave this talk, we were like, okay, this is basically done. But as it sort of goes in the last half a year of writing, uh, a lot of things change. So it's sort of quite fun if you have some time after this talk to sort of go back to Theo's slides and compare whether you can find sort of the similarities or not. Um, right. And so I should say everything I'm going to talk about here is, is trying to work with, with Theo. Um, so let's get started. I'm not sure I'm going to make it to the end of this, uh, to the end of, of, of this proof. Uh, the interesting things, the sort of important things about fusion two categories, they happen sort of around the middle of the talk. And then I'll just see how, how far I get. And if you have questions, please just ask or interrupt me. Okay, so let's first get some, some basics out of the way. Um, okay, and I noticed that this screen sharing trick that I wanted to do here already doesn't quite work. So I stop and do it the other way. So, boop, boop. okay, here we go. Um, so let me sort of start with some, some basics. Uh, an object in a created fusion category is called transparent. And this is something I think most of you will have seen uh, if it parades trivially with any other object. So if I'm taking any other object B in this parade fusion category, I can look at the parading of this object with this other object B. If this is just the identity, then I'm calling this object transparent. It cannot sort of be seen by any other object if I'm just sort of trying to probe it via parading. And I'm defining the Muga center, uh, which I'm going to note by C sub two of B as just a full subcategory of B on these transparent objects. And um, I'm going to say that a category, a parated fusion category is non-degenerate if this Muga center is trivial. So in other words, uh, if every transparent object, every object that trades trivially with any other object is, is itself trivial, it's just the sum of the tensor unit. Um, and non-degenerate categories are basically sort of the algebraic version of what a modular tensor category are. So uh, many of you will be familiar with modular tensor categories and a modular tensor category essentially is a traded fusion category, which has the property of being non-degenerate and which has this additional structure called a ribbon structure. Uh, and really, so I want to think of, uh, I want you to think of a non-degenerate pre-diffusion category as a modular tensor category minus the ribbon structure. And you can think of this geometrically as, uh, as most of you will know, a modular tensor category gives me an oriented anomalous three-dimensional topological quantum field theory, or if you want, it gives me a two plus one dimensional topological order. Um, and the keyword, the buzzword here is oriented. If I'm dropping this orientation, that's the same as sort of cropping this additional, additional structure or sort of I'm lifting this orientation to a framing. What a non-degenerate predefusion fusion category gives me is just a framed anomalous three plus one dimensional TQFT, or if you want a framed topological two plus one dimensional topological order. So really, I want to think of this, uh, this ribbon structure, I sort of I want to get rid of this for now and just think of the algebraic problem, which is looking at the non-degenerate predefusion fusion category. Thinking of this is sort of a bit of geometry mixed in. And, uh, sort of a consequence of having these, these constructions of having these sort of um, topological interpretations is that we have a lot of additional tools for the study of non-degenerate braided fusion categories that are not available for the study of plain braided fusion categories. So for example, all the things involving some other modular group coming in, that really comes from this, from this geometry of two manifolds and three manifolds that you're seeing here. And you can sort of use that to get a lot of information about modular tensor categories and about non-degenerate braided fusion categories that you just, you don't have these tools accessible for general braided fusion categories. So many tools for the study of non-degenerate braided fusion categories just don't easily generalize to the study of all braided fusion categories. And so a natural question to ask is, does every braided fusion category embed in a non-degenerate braided fusion category? So can I just sort of enlarge it sort of have some more objects so that I end up in a non degenerate pre fusion category? And the answer is, of course, yes. What you can do is you can just take the Trinfeld center of your pre fusion category. That's some other pre fusion category. So you forget that it was pre it's just a fusion category. You can take its Trinfeld center uh, and it's a non degenerate pre fusion category. And my category B itself embeds into this Trinfeld center. 
but this embedding is sort of bad. Uh, the trim field center has lots and lots and lots of new objects which are transparent to B and that weren't originally in B. So somehow we have B, we know what the transparent objects in B are, but now there are sort of new objects which are transparent to B. So you can think of these new objects as something you cannot see just from the perspective of B itself. B has no way of probing these new objects. Um, and so we define a non-degenerate extension is, uh, a non-degenerate extension is, is minimal if the only objects in M which are transparent to B are already in B. So if I'm having some object in M, which trades trivially with every object in B, then it had already to be in, in B. So all the new objects that come in sort of come in by necessity in some sense. I can sort of probe with B all the other objects in M. And, um, and so again, you could ask this question, does every pre diffusion category uh, admit one of these extensions? Does it sort of embed in a non-degenerate pre diffusion category in one of these minimal ways? And I think this was originally asked by Michael Muga in, in 2003. And the answer, which sort of came shortly thereafter, and I think was not never published, but sort of has now sort of appeared in, in, in various papers uh, by Trinfeld was, and no, that's, that's not true. You can construct counterexamples. And sort of starting with sort of the study of these counterexamples, uh, there's sort of a lot of theory has been developed around this. And I think this is culminated in a paper by Galindo and Venegas Ramirez in 2017, but builds on a lot of work by Lang Kong Bang, by David of Muga, Nikshish Ostrich, and, and various other people. And basically what they understand is that there is essentially some cohomological obstruction uh, where if I have some pre diffusion category, I can sort of look at a certain cohomology theory and that cohomology theory tells me whether they exist in on the general extension or not. So that's not quite true. There's sort of one ingredient missing. An ingredient is that I mean, these theories don't know how to handle braided fusion categories uh, whose MUGA center is the category of super vector spaces rather than the category of vector spaces or rather than any other symmetric category. So somehow up to cohomology theory, you can reduce this problem to the problem to the sort of the same question where you restrict to braided fusion categories whose MUGA center is the category of super vector spaces. So, C2 created vector spaces uh, where the braiding has, has a causal sign group. That's sort of the last remaining case missing. And um, what I'm going to talk about uh, now is basically a resolution of this last case that every pre diffusion category whose Muga center is the category of super vector spaces admits a minimal non degenerate extension. And this was known as the minimal modular extension conjecture, or also uh, the 16 fold way conjecture. And I'm going to talk about the 16 uh, later on a little bit. Um, because if I have a pre diffusion category whose uh, Muga center is super vector spaces and it admits some uh, minimal non degenerate extension, then it follows that it admits precisely 16 of those. So if there is one, then they sort of form a torsor uh, over set node 16. Um, and this was sort of this last statement was proven uh, for the easiest case where the pre diffusion category is just super vector spaces itself, was proven by Kitaev, and then for this general case by uh, Bruyard and a sequence, I think, of five other authors. Uh, and I'm going to mention these names later on. So uh, they didn't quite fit on, on this slide, but later on, you'll, you'll see the other authors here as well. Okay, so this brings me sort of to an outline of the proof and sort of equivalently an outline of, of the talk. Um, first, I'm going to take this problem that I just explained to you and translate it into the language of fusion two categories and tell you how this is related to fusion two categories. Uh, and uh, then I'm going to talk about Trinfeld centers of fusion two categories. And essentially this will sort of lead to, to a statement of the form that B admits a minimal non-degenerate extension. If and only if the Trinfeld center of the fusion two categories of modules of this braided fusion one category trivializes in a certain sense. And, and I'll tell you what the certain sense is. And uh, then I'll show, I'll explain that if, if the, the, the Muga center of B is super vector spaces, then I actually know that this category can only be one of two different categories. And it's sort of th these two categories are distinguished by a certain cohomology group. And, uh, and then lastly, you show that actually it can only be one of these categories. So it has to be sort of trivial in, in this way. So this sort of trivializes. So this would be sort of the outline of the proof. And this is also the outline of the, of the talk. So let's get started. What is a fusion two category? So let's forget about minimal modular extensions and sort of start, start afresh and think about fusion two categories. You should think about sort of 
uh, a multifusion two category is to a multifusion one category, like a multifusion one category is to a finite dimensional semi simple algebra. That's sort of the slogan. And so using that slogan, you can go up in dimensions. So let me just give you the definition and let me sort of give you the definition for a multifusion one category that I think most of you will be familiar with and for multifusion two category at the same time to sort of show you how these definitions are parallel to one another. So a multifusion one category, let me just sort of say it first for n equals one. A multifusion one category is, and I'm working here over the complex numbers, everything I'm doing here could be done over an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. Um, but just for the slides, I found it sort of easier to read if it's just the complex numbers. So a multifusion one category is a complex linear monoidal one category such that, and here's sort of a list of conditions that I want to impose. One of the conditions is that it has direct sums and that all idempotents have been split in. So every idempotent is sort of the image of the section retraction pair. And uh, that, that's one of the conditions, that's sort of a completeness condition, a very mild sort of categorical completeness condition. Um, another condition is that it's locally, um, and in this case, it shouldn't be my, say multifusion, but semi-simple, uh, that's locally semi-simple. So the endomorphism algebra of every object is a semi-simple algebra. Another condition is that all objects have duals, and the last condition is it's finite, meaning it has only finitely many isomorphism classes of symbols. So I'm going to say what this condition means in a second. So how do we categorify this? Well, we basically write down the same definition. Um, so we say a multifusion two category is a complex linear monoidal two category. It has direct sums and all so-called two idempotents split. Uh, two idempotents is a, is a two categorical version of what it means to be an idempotent. Uh, it's closely related in the two categorical case to the notion of a separable algebra. And categorically, it comes from, from Karubi completion, so it has a correct universal property. Um, and, and so that was sort of I mean, a big ingredient of the theory is knowing what two item problems are. And, and I'm sort of cheating because I'm not going to tell you exactly what they are, but I, you can sort of look at the paper. And this is, uh, has been done uh, in a paper with Chris Douglas. And then I'm asking all of the endomorphisms monoidal categories to be multifusion categories. So this is sort of this local multifusion condition. Rigid again means all objects have duals. And then there's a finiteness condition for which uh, we need a, bit, a little bit of sort of additional input that I'm going to talk about now. Um, namely, before, let me sort of skip over this finiteness condition. Let me first talk about what a simple object is. Um, one notices, one can show that an object is simple in sort of the correct two categorical sense, if and only if it's indecomposable under the uh, direct sum operation. And this is also true if and only if the endomorphisms of the identity of this object are just a ground field that uses algebraically closeness of the ground field. So compare this with, again, uh, the definition of a multifusion one category, that's the same is true. An object is simple if and only if it's directly some indecomposable and the endomorphisms of the object are the ground field. So here we're sort of one level, one further level away from the, from the complex numbers level. So I need to look at the endomorphism of the identity on that object. Um, and then uh, there, here's the definition. I will say that two simple objects are sure connected if there exists a non-zero one morphism between them. And notice that if I'm in n equals one, connected is the same as being isomorphic, and that's basically just Schur's lemma. So this statement here is Schur's lemma. For n equals two, that's not true anymore. Of course, if you're isomorphic, then you're connected, but connected does not imply isomorphic. So you can have objects that are connected, but are not isomorphic. Um, However, it turns out, and this uh, we call sort of the two categorical Schur's lemma, that um, the relation of being Schur connected is an equivalence relation. So that's something non-trivial that happens in this sort of very finite, nice linear setting. Um, it's, it's in particular, um, right, there's sort of a bunch of non-trivial content in there. I mean, the most interesting one, I guess, is, is transitivity of this relation. If I'm having a non-zero morphism from A to B and a non-zero morphism from B to C, uh, then there also exists a non-zero morphism from A to C that we get from by a composition. So the composition of non-zero things is again non-zero. It's sort of a bit like a domain. Um, and, and we define the sure components of one of these higher multifusion categories to basically be the simple objects up to this relation sure connectivity. So in, for n equals one, the sure components of a multifusion one category are just a set of isomorphism classes of simple objects, but in higher dimensions, it's sort of a, a smaller set. So the set of isomorphism classes maps sort of subjects onto the sure components because this is sort of a finer, 
sorry, this is a causal equivalence relation. And um, so this equivalence relation, you should think of a, a multi-fusion two category as, or a semi-simple two category, I guess, is just if you have these sort of collections of simple objects and you have, some of them are all connected to one another. And if there's sort of, if two of them are connected and all of them are connected, but because this is an equivalence relation and sort of these various blocks don't talk to one another. Uh, we'll see some examples in, in a second. Okay, so that's the definition of a fusion two category. Uh, and now having defined what the true components are, we can now say what finiteness means. Finiteness means you have finitely many components. Um, so it, indeed in dimension two for n equals two, it turns out that this is again equivalent to asking uh, to have finitely many isomorphism classes of, or equivalence classes of simple objects, but in general, um, this is really the, the correct definition of finiteness and, and sort of equivalence classes when sort of don't seem to come up that much in this, in this theory of higher semi-simple categories. Um, it's really always about these, these uh, sure connectivity notion. Okay. And let me say one last thing. Uh, of course, now I have defined what a multi-fusion two category is or multi-fusion one category as well, sort of at the same time. Uh, fusion is the same uh, definition as, as usual. Fusion, you say a multi-fusion two category is fusion if the tensor unit is, is a simple object. Uh, so that's sort of the last, the last bit of the definition. And that, that, that is the definition. Um, are there any questions on that slide? Okay, um, so let's let's look a bit on the comparison between fusion two categories and braided fusion one categories. So whenever I have a braided fusion, or whenever I have a fusion two category, or in fact, whenever I have a monoidal two category, I can look at the endomorphisms of the tensor unit, and that forms a braided fusion one category. So I have a map which takes a fusion two category and maps it to a braided fusion one category, and I'm going to denote this map, and this is just notation as sort of omega. And I think of it as a sort of uh, non-invertible loop space, right? It takes the endomorphisms of the tensor unit. And it turns out that this map has a, has a left adjoint. So there is a way to take a braided fusion one category to a fusion two category. Now, if I wouldn't have all these adjectives like fusion and, and, and fusion here, if I just have braided one categories and monoidal two categories, then what this map would do, it would just take a braided monoidal one category and think of it as a monoidal two category with a single object. So sort of a de-looping operation. I take a braided monoidal one category, think of it as a monoidal two category with one object. And so here, what this map is doing is it's the same, take de-loop, so take it and think of it as a monoidal two category with one object, but then you also have to complete with respect to these direct sums, and you also have to complete with respect to these two categorical items. And that produces a lot of new objects. Um, and there are sort of two different equivalent ways of talking about this operation. Another way of talking about it or thinking about it is that it also is equivalent to the monoidal two category whose objects are finite semi-simple B module categories. These morphisms are module functors and these two morphisms are natural transformations or B module natural transformations. Um, and yet another way of thinking about this is that it's sort of a Merida category in B whose objects are separable algebras in B, whose one morphisms are bimodule objects in B and whose two morphisms are bimodule maps. So these are sort of all three different definitions and really they all give sort of this, this left to join to the functor which takes a fusion two category and forgets uh, and just looks at its endomorphisms of one. So in some sense, yeah. Um, and in fact, it turns out that if I have a fusion two category, which is connected in the sense of the sure connectivity, so if this just has a single component, that's equivalent to saying this fusion two category is in the image of this functor. And in fact, this adjunction we're looking at here restricts to an equivalence on uh, when sort of having here just a connected fusion two categories. Um, and I'm going to denote this left adjoint as, as sigma, which of course uh, should remind you of this uh, symbol for suspension, because that's sort of a non-invertible version of suspension in this, in this theory. Okay, so, so you could think if I'm studying braided fusion one categories, that's really the same as studying connected fusion two categories. So if I have my braided fusion one category, we from now on going to think of it as a connected fusion two category. Okay, and here's finally an example of a fusion two category. Let me just look at the suspension of the category of super vector spaces. Um, so 
I'm going to just tell you what it is, and then I'm going to tell you how we can figure out why it is of this form. So this is going to have two simple objects. Let me just call them I and C. These are just names. And these are sort of the, and I'm not going to, yeah, this is just the, the underlying two category. I'm not yet talking about the monoidal structure. The endomorphisms of I is just a category of super vector spaces. Similarly, the endomorphisms of C are the category of super vector spaces. And the homs from one to the other and from the other to one are basically both of them are the category of vector spaces. Um, and I haven't yet told you how, you know, if I'm composing an endomorphism with a homomorphism, this is just a sort of natural action of super vector spaces on vector spaces. Um, okay, so now, as you can see, this category has one component because there are two simple objects, but they are connected. There is a non-zero map between them. And so it has one component. This is really a connected fusion two category. And uh, I haven't yet told you the monoidal structure. I won't tell you the whole monoidal structure. But for example, you can see that if I'm squaring C, I get the, the identity. So there's sort of additional fusion information in there that I haven't yet really told you. Those are, in some sense, the fusion rules at the level of objects for this fusion 2 category. And the way to see why it is of this shape is you can think of this, right, as a category of separable algebras and super vector spaces. So those are sort of the so called separable super algebras. And in these terms, the simple objects, one of them you can think of as the trivial algebra, and the other one you can think of as sort of the, the uh, Clifford one algebra. Uh, so the, the um, even line plus the odd line with its sort of uh, interesting algebra structure. So those are the two simple objects in here. And, and from that, you can work out uh, that this is the underlying structure of the semi simple two category. And from that, you can also start working out these, these fusion groups. Um, okay. So, so much about. Uh, about how fusion two categories are related to creating fusion one categories. Uh, any questions on this? There is a question in the chat. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, I'm just looking at the question. The question is, is the uh, is super vector spaces here over the complex numbers and does the choice of field even matter? Um, so super vector spaces here is over the complex numbers. If you have a field which is algebraically close and characteristic zero, uh, that all just works fine. I think probably, I mean, you definitely want to have characteristic not equal to two. Um, and I think you want to make, and you also want to make sure that it's algebraically closed. Otherwise you get, I mean, to get these particular fusion rules because otherwise you get division algebras in the category of vector spaces appearing as well. Um, but then, then you're fine, I think. So is this a shadow somehow of odd periodicity that you get? Yes. Or sorry, of Clifford periodicity that you get? This, this fusion rule is, uh, is, uh, is based on periodicity over the complex numbers. Right, if you do it for, um, if you do it for super vector spaces over the real numbers, you basically get eight simple objects and, and you get sort of this uh, C mod eight odd periodicity as the fusion is appearing, exactly. Um, exactly. But for this talk here, I'm going to restrict to the complex numbers or sort of equivalently algebraically first characteristic zero, and then you just see sort of complex dot periodicity here appearing. Yeah. Yep. Is there exactly. This is, this is sort of how you compute this fusion rule essentially is dot, dot periodicity. Was there another question? Is there a higher uh, version of this theorem? So n connected. Things like that. Um, yes, um, I guess it does not. You apply suspensions for n times. Yeah, I guess right. If if you're sort of not talking about fusion two categories, we're getting sort of too close to the level where things are just the numbers. But if you would have fusion n categories, <clears throat> then if you're sort of k connected, uh, that means you're sort of um, you know k fold suspension of some wow. so and so loop. Thing, like some E K monoidal, uh, nice, you know, in minus K type category. Oh, well, that's cool. How about so if you take a braided fusion one cat and you apply loop? No, no sorry, suspension and then loop. What yes. do you get? You get the original thing back. So this really restricts to an equivalence on the connected oh. fusion two categories. So okay. connected sort of functors between monoidal functors between connected fusion two categories do come from braided are sort of equivalent to braided monoidal functors. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay. So now um, 
we also need to talk about trinfet centers of fusion two catalysts. Uh, so again, let me not give the definition, but let me sort of give you the intuition of what this is about. If I'm having an algebra, I can look at its center, and that's some commutative algebra, and this categorifies to the trinfet center of the nodal one category, right? His objects are an object together with now I can't just say it commutes. I have to give you sort of natural isomorphism, so-called half gradings, which tell you how things commute, and they have to fulfill some coherence conditions. And this again categorifies to a, a two categorical notion of trinfet center, and sort of in various uh, the frameworks for monoidal two categories, this has been developed in particular for monoidal bi categories, which is sort of the word we're working in here. Um, but you also get this uh, in, in other frameworks. And, um, and now this is sort of two categorical trend field center, something very, very generic, very general. Uh, we are going to look at, or for now, let me just look at two categorical trend field centers of fusion two categories, which are of the form sigma B, so which are connected. Uh, and for these, something sort of pretty nice happens because I have sort of this very particular presentation of this fusion two category in terms of this graded fusion one category. What will happen, and this is essentially a theorem uh, by Davidoff and Nikshish, is that this graded fusion two category is equivalent as a graded fusion two category to the two category of so-called graded module categories of B. And this is a very particular uh, graded monoidal two category that I'm going to briefly tell you what it is. So what is a graded module of a graded fusion category? A graded module category of B is a module category, just sort of a, a module category, which is just a monoidal structure on B, equipped with the so-called module grading. And a module grading is a natural isomorphism, sigma M B, which goes from N, which is object in M, and B is an object in B, and this is the action of B and M, to M tensor B, which fulfills a bunch of coherent co coherence conditions. And really, you should think of this, uh, and, and you can sort of work out what these coherence conditions are if you think of it diagrammatically, namely the sigma MB, you should think of as sort of being that type of move, right? In a module category, I can take sort of, I can take my monoidal category B and put it to the right of a single strand, which is labeled by M, which is sort of my module. But now I have this addition, now my B is graded, so I can sort of grade around here. Now I have this additional move that I can sort of move objects in B around these objects in, in M. That's what a graded module category is. And these braided module categories assemble into a two category. You have braided module categories, you have module functors which preserve this, this, this module braiding, and you have natural transformations between these. And, and that two category is equivalent to the string field center of sigma B. Um, if you like factorization algebras, the data of a braided module category is essentially um, a sort of stratified factorization algebra over a disk with a marked point. Um, so it's an E2 module. There's sort of once I'm having an operat, I also have a notion of sort of from algebra with this operand, I have the natural notion of a module for that operand. And so this is an E2 module, if, if you like that kind of language. Um, and this is going to be quite a quite a useful model of this of this graded fusion two category. You can, of course, think of it abstractly, sort of ask what are the simple objects and so on. But here, this gives you sort of a nice presentation of it in terms of these graded module categories. And um, in our paper, uh, with Theo, we use uh, two other models of the string fit center that I won't have time to talk about, but that I quite like. Uh, one of them is, and this is also something that you can sort of think about just from the perspective of factorization algebras, uh, but you can also sort of work out concretely here, is you can take the ordinary Trinfeld center of this graded fusion one category. That's, you know, the Trinfeld center that you, that you all know. This has its usual monoidal structure, but it has another monoidal structure as well, which is sort of the annular tensor product, which comes from thinking of it as the factorization homology over a circle. Uh, often the two algebra, there's still sort of an E1 structure left. So there is this sort of weird additional tensor product. Uh, with this additional tensor product, this is just a multifusion category rather than a fusion category. And I can take the, mod the categories of modules of that multifusion category. That's again equivalent to this uh, Trinfield center. Um, and, but from this perspective, it's, it's, it's not so easy to see the graded monoidal structure. And yet another perspective that I quite like is there is a way to phrase this just in terms of certain algebra objects. So you can look at certain algebra objects in B with sort of some additional structure and bi modules which sort of preserve this additional structure. Uh, and that again gives me a two category and that is also equivalent to this to the center. So there's sort of a list of, of different models for this, for this thing. Okay. So now let me sort of say a little bit about these trinfet centers. And for this, I find it helpful to briefly give you sort of an idea of how, how to think of predominant two categories in terms of, sort of string diagrams. 
Um, so most of you will be familiar with the string diagrammatic calculus for predictive minority one categories. Essentially, right? Uh, if I'm drawing a picture like this, I, I like to think of this as a morphism in some predictive minority one category, and sort of very roughly, just to keep, get the idea across, an object I think of as sort of one of these lines in, in three dimensional space, and a morphism is sort of a bunch of uh, morphisms are dots on these on these lines, right? And they could sort of these lines could branch out at the morphism or do whatever. The morphism doesn't have to live in a line; it can live in empty space. So this is sort of just a generic diagram in the braided monoidal one category. And similarly, braided monoidal two category, you should think of as uh, the objects being surfaces which live in four dimensional space. Uh, the one morphisms being lines in these surfaces and the two morphisms being dots on these lines. So here again is a, is a generic diagram. So here I'm having sort of two surfaces which braid with one another in four space. Of course, I have to project it to three space to be able to you know, draw it. Um, but this is sort of, you know, the, Braiding of two surfaces in, in four space. Him having a line which moves through these surfaces again, sort of wiggling around in, in four dimensional space. Uh, here I'm having sort of a, a type of branching between these surfaces, and here I'm having a bunch of two morphisms that fly around like this. So that's the sort of picture idea you should have if you think about the two category. Um, and from these pictures, or otherwise from the axioms. You see that if I have a braided monoidal two category and I'm looking just in the in the morphisms of the tensor units, so I'm just looking at the lines and forgetting about all of these surfaces, then this forms a symmetric monoidal one category because the braiding of two lines in four space is, is trivial, or sort of braid and unbraid. Um, and in particular, for this braided monoidal two category that we're looking at here for the string field center of sigma b. Uh, if I'm looking at the loops, so if I'm looking at the endomorphisms of the tensor unit, there is a particular symmetric monoidal category I get out, and this is just the uh, mega center. So now we also see how the mega center arises, right? I told you for my predictive fusion two one category, I can turn it into sigma b, which is a fusion two category. And how do I see the mega center? The mega center is the endomorphisms of the unit in the trim phase center of this fusion two category. So it appears as if I'm making my problem more complicated <laughs> rather than easier. Um, but but here's the slogan. Um, you can think of the string field center of sigma b, therefore, as a kind of two categorical refinement of the Muga center. So it knows about the Muga center and it has some more information. And in some sense, the sort of natural question is okay, how much more information does it actually have? How much more does uh, the string field center of sigma b know about b that sort of the Muga center doesn't know? And the answer to this problem is what links this whole theory of fusion two categories and the Trinfield centers to this problem of minimal modular extensions. Namely, you get an equivalence between two croupoids. One of them is the croupoid of braided monoidal equivalences between the Trinfield center of sigma b and the Trinfield center of sigma of the Muga center of b. So I can sort of take all of sigma b and I can just take, uh, sort of, I can sigma all of b or I can sigma just the Muga center and take their Trinfield centers. Those have the same endomorphisms of one, um, but they might in general be different. But if they are equivalent, right, this sort of intuitively, this might be much larger. But if they are equivalent, that's exactly the case when B admits a minimum non degenerate extension. Rather than studying directly whether B admits minimum non degenerate extensions, we can sort of turn this problem into trying to distinguish or not distinguish these two braided fusion two categories. Right. If I can show that these two pre diffusion two categories are equivalent, then I know that this B will admit a minimum on the channel extension. That's sort of, in some sense, that's like the key thing we're using in this translation. Okay. So, um, so this gives sort of good justification for studying these string field centers of sigmas of Bs somehow. If, if, if you're not anyway sort of just interested in, in, in what happens with this theory, uh, I think this equivalence tells you, you know, if you want to study minimum non-degenerate extensions, you should study these just these categories and see what can happen, right? How, how hard is it to construct such equivalences or how, you know, how easily is it obstructed to have such equivalences? Um, and so the first thing we should sort of recall, if I'm looking not at the Trinfeld center of some braided fusion uh, of some, you know, fusion two category, but rather the Trinfeld center of some fusion one category, then this is a non-degenerate braided fusion one category. This is a modular tensor category. Uh, so Trinfeld centers are modular tensor categories. So sort of the easiest example of modular tensor categories. So you could ask, is there something analogous happening in this one dimension higher? So let me just recall the, uh, the, the one way to think about these, these modular, or another way to think about this non-degenerate categories, these modular tensor categories, is a braided fusion one category is non-degenerate, even only if a certain S matrix you can build is non-degenerate. 
So if there would be ribbon, the way to build the S matrix, of course, is that you look at the hop length uh, of the two circles, you label them with sort of simple objects, and you ask this to be a non degenerate made vertical matrix. That's sort of the, the, the standard and sort of physics motivated way to define what it means to be a modular tensor category. Um, if you don't have this ribbon structure, you can't quite form circles uh, because uh, there's an issue, of course, with, with orientations. Um, but there is still a way to form an S matrix by picking certain sort of well normalized isomorphisms from X to X double dual, essentially. So there's sort of a bit of a technicality uh, how to generalize this from ribbon categories to sort of just plain graded fusion categories, but the same theory continues to work. And so we can just continue sort of playing a similar game for braided fusion two categories and we define an S matrix, uh, but this time this S matrix takes a simple object and it takes a simple endomorphisms of the identity. So this group here you can think of as, as a sort of pi one of C uh, and it passed these together by taking a sphere and linking them with the circle. That's sort of the only dimensions in which you can link together in this four dimensional ambient space, right? You can link sort of two manifolds and one manifold. So you can't, you can't link one and one manifold. So that's sort of a, a pairing you can build uh, on this braid diffusion two category. I mean, if you, if you like uh, topology, uh, if this wouldn't be a braided fusion two category, but some braided denoidal group like two group void, then this is essentially computing the whitehead, the whitehead bracket, or one of the whitehead brackets. And now, of course, we expect that Z of sigma b is non degenerate. And what we can show is that the S matrix of the set of sigma B is non degenerate. So it is non degenerate, at least in this S matrix sense. And I haven't defined this other sense as being non degenerate with sort of trivial Nuga center. Uh, that's also true, but, but for now, it suffices to, to be able to show that the S matrix of the set of sigma B is non degenerate, this S matrix. But now notice something funny, this S matrix, so this S matrix is diagonal, right? It takes sort of a simple and a simple because in this case sort of uh, dimension one and dimension one together, uh, you know, link. Um, here, this is a non-diagonal matrix. The so non-degeneracy of the S matrix in particular implies that both of these sets have the same size. And so in particular, in this case of set of sigma B, this set is just a set of components of set of sigma B. Whereas this set, right, recall that loops of set of sigma B is just a Muga center. So this is now just a set of isomorphism classes of simple objects in the Muga center of B. So I know that set of sigma B has as many components as the Muga center of B has simple objects. And in particular, if the Muga center of B is just a category of super vector spaces, uh, that means that set of sigma B has precisely two components. So it has sort of two of these blocks where all simple objects are connected to one another and where sort of these blocks don't talk to one another via morphisms, right? They might have a sort of an interesting minority structure and gradient minority structure that, that matches these two blocks up. But if I'm just looking at the underlying two category, that's sort of the shape we're looking at. And these two components, you can, I mean, this theorem tells you more. It doesn't just tell you that these sort of the sizes of these sets are the same. It tells you that this linking matrix is, is an invertible matrix. So this means that I can distinguish these two components by braiding them with the non-trivial simple object in the category of super vector spaces. So I'm taking the odd line, uh, that's some simple object in the category of super vector spaces. And I can look at the braiding of this odd line with some object in this braided monoidal two category. And uh, this braiding, if this object itself is simple, then this braiding can either be the identity or it can be minus the identity. And that, does, that tells you in which component an object is. So if I'm taking a simple object, and you ask, you know, in which of these two blocks sort of is it? Uh, well, what you have to do is you have to parade it with the electron. Uh, sorry, I, I just called it the electron, but you have to parade it with this odd line. And I like to think first of this component, I think of as a trivial component, because that's the component where every object, every simple object in here is actually connected to uh, the tensor unit. And this component, uh, we like to call the magnetic component, because right, we think of this odd line as being the electron. And so we think of one of these sheets as being sort of non-trivially magnetically charged because right, this is sort of a picture in four space. If I'm looking at this as a movie of pictures in three space, uh, what happens is that I have sort of this, this rod labeled by N and I have this green dot, which is the electron and I'm sort of moving it around uh, this rod once. And by doing that, I'm picking up a phase of minus one. And so somehow if I think of this, you know, odd line in super vector spaces as an electron, uh, it follows that I have to think of this surface here, this object instead of sigma b is sort of a magnetic, a magnetic object, and this is some sort of um, like, uh, sort of you know this 
S matrix pairing is some sort of electromagnetic type uh, interaction. And so this is sort of the magnetic component, this interesting component instead of sigma B, uh, and then you have the trivial component. Any questions on this? You, uh, in the theorem, you says it's diagonal. It's like mm -hmm. uh, diagonal on the nose, you mean? Oh, no, sorry, sorry. This is, uh, this is really bad. I didn't mean to write diagonal. It is square. Oh. It's a square matrix. That's what I meant. Sorry. That's, that's just a typo. And it's a typo of the very bad sort where it's like a whole word typo. Um, no, 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 that, that was super misleading. It's, it's a square. It's a square matrix. It's an invertible matrix. It has to be a square matrix. But this is sort of a non trivial statement here because these sets are a priori not the same size. Uh huh. Does it also satisfy some interesting identity? Like in modular tensor categories, you have S, S to the fourth being almost being identity, something like that. Yeah, I mean, in the uh, in modular tensor categories, uh, the identities in some sense come from the fact that you can think of the S matrix as arising from um, the twist. Essentially, yeah, operations of the mapping class group of the twists. Yes. And similarly, here you can think of this S matrix as essentially arising as sort of operations on S two cross S one. And so you have slightly sort of a slightly different mapping class group, but nice. that's sort of start translating these things, but that's, so that's not in this paper, but at some point, maybe something will come up about this. But yes, in principle, there is sort of an analogous theory you could expect, but this is not the way. Cool, look we'll forward to it, thanks. Um, okay, so now, um, now here's a statement. Up to braided equivalence, and I sort of won't prove this, this statement, but I just tell you the statement. Up to braided equivalence, it turns out that there are precisely two different braided fusion two categories with the following properties. They have just two components and their loops is s vec Sort of these, these lines in there are just super vector spaces. And it turns out that these two braided fusion two categories have actually the same underlying fusion two category, but they have different gradings. And in fact, the gradings differ only in sort of really, really high level data. So that's a bit annoying because you don't, it's really hard to tell them apart, but you can tell them apart. Um, and, and the way to do this, one way to do this is essentially in the end, some cohomology uh, computation of, of a certain uh, einberg nickelin space. Um, up to first do a bunch of braided fusion stuff, and then at some point you can reduce it to that computation. So, but it turns out that this is then a, a true statement. And so let's just call them for now, uh, curly S and curly T. Those are my two braided fusion two categories, right? And, and right, note that if B is, uh, if, if B is um, a braided fusion one category whose Muga center is SVEC, then the set of sigma B is of this form. It has two components and its loops are SVEC. So it must either be equivalent to S or equivalent to T. And the goal, somehow the way we prove this theorem then is to say that T in fact is not a Trinfeld center at all, right? I mean, if you sort of with this question, you might be familiar if you study modular categories. If I give you a modular category, it's a reasonable question to ask, is that a Trinfeld center or is it not a Trinfeld center? So is it sort of tri a trivial modular category or is it an interesting modular category? And basically we have sort of here have the same type of problem. We have these two braided fusion two categories and we want to say, well, one of them is not a Trinfeld center. If one of them is not a Trinfeld center, if T is not a Trinfeld center, it must be that this guy, because it is a Trinfeld center and it is either equivalent to S or to T, well, then it must be equivalent to S. But similarly, this guy is the Trinfeld center. Again, therefore, it must be either equivalent to S or T. Well, but T is not a Trinfeld center, so it must be equivalent to S. So these two guys need, to, so these, all of these three need to be equivalent. And therefore, B needs to admit a minimum modular extension because having an equivalence like this is equivalent to having a minimum modular extension. That's sort of the, the idea. So, okay, what to do to show that T is not a Trinfeld center? Um, and sort of similarly, the question is how to tell S and T apart. And now I sort of, uh, I'd love to have sort of, with sort of a number of ideas of trying to show that T is not a Trinfeld center. And some of them are nicer and some of them are sort of more hacky. And we settled with one, which is sort of semi hack Like it, it's okay. It's not the nicest way to tell that something is not a Trinfeld center, but, but it works for this, for this purpose and turned out to be sort of the easiest, most direct argument. But I think um, essentially in the end, you would really like to do some type of anomaly computation, which is what you do for a modular tensor category to show it's not a Trinfeld center. And that we haven't done yet. So there's sort of a, a number of, of alternative proofs that sort of suggest themselves here. 
But the way we distinguish them is to say, okay, if C is either T or S, and M is any simple magnetic object, so it's any simple object which lives in this sort of magnetic component, um, then M can be extended to a braided monoidal two functor out of C mod two, where I think of C mod two just as a discrete braided monoidal two category, if and only if C is S. So if I'm taking this M, what do I have to do to extend it, right? I take M, first I have to give me an isomorphic one equivalence between M squared and one. And then I have to give higher and higher coherence to that uh, up to a certain point because we just upgraded the minority two categories. And I'm telling you that giving this higher and higher coherence data is only possible for S and it won't be possible for T. Unfortunately, the issue will arise at the very top. So it looks, so both for S and T, it will look like everything works. So you can pick an equivalence from N squared to one, you can pick sort of higher coherence and only at the very top will there be a difference. Basically. Um, so that's one way to tell these apart, and that's sort of the way that that works for us. It's sort of some type of, sort of, it feels a bit similar to um, uh, to sort of Frobenius Shaw indicators in infusion one categories. It's sort of a similar type, type flavor of of obstruction in some sense. Um, okay. So. So let's let's be concrete. What it means to, to sort of extend this choice of simple object to a braided minority two factor. Um, so to prove that the set of sigma b, which we know is the same as braided modules of b, is equivalent to s. Well, let's just try to build one of these braided minority two functors out of C mod two. So the first thing we have to do is we have to pick some simple braided magnetic module category M. So this is just a simple magnetic object, right? Um, but now we know that the objects are braided module categories. So let's just take this M. And it turns out there are two choices for this. Uh, and now we try to extend this choice of one of these two choices to a braided two factor. So what do we have to do? And sort of a good way to figure out what to do is, uh, of course, you just look at sort of a cell complex for, well, this one way to figure this out is you essentially look for a cell complex of the Zeinberg McLean space, KC2, comma two, and then just sort of go cell by cell and see what data you have to give. And if you have to give sort of a convenient one of these, uh, you get the following. Uh, first, you have to give an equivalence from N squared to one. Right, in terms of braided module categories, this means an equivalence of the uh, braided module category tensor over B with itself to N and to B. Again, there are two choices for this. And then next, so this up to this point, you can expect that that's, that's what it means to give a functor out of C two. Next, you have to make sure that uh, this object M braids trivially with itself, because again, that's what you need for a functor out of, out of C two. So you have to give an equivalence from the braiding of M with itself to the identity of M. And it turns out that there, or this is already an isomorphism. And it turns out that this is a torso over the invertible complex numbers. Um, and next, there are two obstructions you have to fulfill. First, there's a certain obstruction which I'm not going to write out. This is some sort of formula, some expression in M, R, and phi. We actually don't, or I actually don't quite know what this formula is, but I know one thing about this formula, which is it's quartic in phi. So if I'm rescaling phi by some number A, I can sort of pull this number out and get A to the four. And so since I have sort of previously, I said there was sort of a torso over C cross of choices of phi. So I can just use that torso to rescale phi to just make this number be one. And so really I'm left with four admissible choices of phi rather than this torso that I've previously had. Now really there are just four allowed choices of phi. And then there's another obstruction which just depends on M and R. And this is now an actual obstruction. I can't just get rid of that obstruction by rescaling stuff. And it turns out that this obstruction is where T and S differ. Like this whole game up to this point, I could have done for T and for S and it would just have sort of gone through. But at this point, it would turn out that whatever choices I pick for T, I'd get that this number is minus one. Whereas whatever choices I did for S, I get that this number is one. So that's how you sort of see the difference between S and T. So what we have to make sure is that if I'm doing this for sort of graded module categories, I'm getting out of one here and not a minus one. And and in fact, sort of let me say that this sort of strategy is, is actually constructive if I would have a braided module category and I would sort of manage to get a one down here. Then I immediately know what the minimum non-degenerate extension is. Namely, you just take the category, which is B plus M. And um, the data one, you already see, but on the data two here, you see this is sort of a map from M tensor M to B. So what this gives me, or what this sort of starts to give me is a monoidal structure on B plus M. And all of these pieces together, uh, is precisely what you need to build a braided monoidal structure on B plus M. So I've never sort of done that by hand, but I think it would be a nice, nice exercise or difficult exercise to see 
that somehow to give a braided monoidal structure on B plus M, which is compatible with the braided module structure on M and the braided monoidal structure on B. Um, as the same as sort of making all these choices. And then the fact that M was magnetic, the sort of that it creates non-trivially with the with, with B, with the um, you know, fermion in the symmetric in the media center of B is what ensures that this braided monoidal one category is non intrepid So that, that is a way to sort of, in hindsight, construct this non intrepid extension. Okay, so what is left to do is to, to say that, uh, is to say that this is one, if I'm starting with a braided magnetic module category. So if I'm starting with an object instead of sigma B. And the way to do this is that you have to figure out what the substruction is, how to compute it. And it turns out that this can be computed by evaluating essentially in terms of some sort of, in terms of this graphical calculus, um, but geometrically what it is, is it's you have to evaluate a certain projectively framed Klein bottle, bottle, which is embedded in R4. And this you can define algebraically in any creative minority two category uh, for fully dualizable objects, which are equipped with sort of a self duality of some isomorphism from end to end. Here. Once you have that data, you can build this, this number KMR, which lives sort of in the loops. Um, you can define it algebraically and geometrically, as I said, right over sort of TGFT, Cobertus hypothesis perspective, it's, it's uh, some Klein bottle. And um, it turns out, and this is in the end a computation, that if I'm having some B whose Muga center is super vector spaces and any choice of M, some simple magnetic module, graded module, and any choice of R, uh, then it follows that this obstruction is, is one. And so it follows that actually set of sigma B has to be equivalent to S. And so it follows that B admits a minimal non-degenerate extension. And on the last slide, I stress sort of the number of choices I had here. I had two choices, he had two choices, he had four choices, um, because this nicely recovers the 16th fold way. The two times two times four choices we've seen in the last slide, those correspond to the 16 different minimum non degenerate extensions I could have made. So I could have chosen if I put sort of there are 16 different choices I had to make, and all of them lead to a minimum non degenerate extension. They are all inequivalent, and that recovers this uh, 16 fold way in its generalization to, uh, you know, by these authors that I sort of previously didn't name, and now I'm naming them. This is Priya, Galindo, Hagen, Blavnik, Raul, and uh, Van. And, um, and that's the end of my talk, and I'm, I haven't run over, so I'm quite happy with that. And um, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I will just uh, turn the recording off now. <laughs>